Can I say, when the PISA TISC results came out last year, there was consternation in our country that we'd fallen in the rankings. How was it in Finland when the rankings went down? What was the reaction? What should we make of that? You know, Finland has never really been too excited about the PISA results, not in the good days and, and not in the bad, bad times, because we, are, we, we don't think education as a global competition. When the results were published uh, in, uh, in December, last December, we already had a lot of domestic data and research uh, indicating what, what, what are the kind of a trends within our school system. And uh, there was a kind of an expectation that the, our results uh, will not be as they used to be for two reasons. One is that th there's something, uh, something probably happening among our boys in, in, uh, in Finland that we, uh, the school system is not able to attract the boys to study math and, and reading and science as they used to. But then the other one, and the, probably the more important one, is that there are so many other countries around the world that have, are just basically driving their school policies and school improvement and almost everything they do uh, in order to improve their PISA results. And since the PISA is a kind of a statistical uh, game, if some, uh, some countries do better, improve a lot, then some has to uh, lose. And, and that's why Finland has been on the, uh, we have been on the losing side because we have not really paid any attention to, uh, you know, getting better in the PISA league tables. So what should you pay attention to? What are you paying attention to in Finland? You know, Finland is a country uh, or society, a nation, where equality and equity are really the, the kind of a key values. And it's a, it's a kind of an interesting thing that it goes across uh, most of the society, most of the people think that what really matters in education and in life in general is that everybody has a share of good life. And, and regularly, if you ask Finnish people that what are they most uh, concerned of, uh, the environment is not uh, the kind of a main concern or war, uh, or anything like this, most people say that they are afraid of increasing inequality in the country. And this probably explains a little bit also why so many Finnish people think that the most important thing in our education system, the school system, is uh, uh, that we can maintain and enhance the equity and equality uh, in, in a way that the, the school system should provide the same equal opportunities for everybody to be successful. You see, that would, I would say, is a core New Zealand value. And it, it, we have this idea of the fair go, that everybody right. should get a fair go. Right. But not every child is getting a fair go in New Zealand. It, it isn't an equitable system. How do you do it? How do you ensure that every child gets to uh, realise their potential? Yeah, first of all, I think the internationally there's a, there's a big gap, gap, gap between the, the people speaking about equity and saying that it's important and then really doing it. And I, I think that Finland is one of those countries where we really do, you know, take these things very seriously. And for example, uh, how the schools are resourced, that we are very careful in ma making sure that the schools where we have more immigrant children or more uh, children coming from poorer families, that they have more resources in terms of uh, smaller class sizes and assistant teachers and other resources that they can uh, use uh, for, for that. But I, I think the critical difference between, for example, New Zealand and Finland in this way is that we, we, have, a, we have a different philosophy in special needs uh, education, how, how we are helping and, and dealing with those children who have uh, more, more needs and who require more help uh, than, than the others. And I, I think that, that that's a kind of a critical thing, that it's not only about you know, having a special education system in a place or uh, having a policy that will help those who are in need, but how to do it, that's a kind of a critical thing. And I, I think that the beauty of Finnish system is that we, have, we are intervening very, very early on, much earlier than any other system in the world, in order to make, make sure that these individuals will be helped on day one when there is a kind of a need. How early is it preschool or what, what, how early are you intervening? Well, you know, th this basically begins already in the, uh, in the uh, family uh, when, when the kids are uh, very, very small and young and still with the, with the parents. We have a system like you, have pr you probably also have that every, every child must go through a kind of a healthcare and developmental checks uh, regularly before they go to school. Mm -hmm. Kids go to school in Finland when they're seven. And every child before they start the school, they have already done several of these kind of a comprehensive medical and developmental checks. So when the child enters the school at the age of seven, the school already knows that, you know, what has been the past and, and kind of a 
uh, growth of this uh, individual. If there are any issues there, they can start to help uh, immediately. Our children start at five. What happens to your children before the age of seven? They play two more years. And I think that that's a kind of a uh, very essential thing in Finland. And there are very few people actually in my country right now that who would be in favor of starting schooling, formal schooling earlier than, than age seven. So that's why, because we, we, we think that play is a kind of a fundamental uh, tool for children and, and people to realize that they have imagination and uh, kind of a cultivate and develop that uh, increasingly important uh, area of our lives. Because this is one of the areas that I wanted to talk with you about is creativity. We live mm -hmm. in the creative mm -hmm. age. Absolutely. I'm making my, my living by talking with you right. while builders are fixing my house back in New Zealand, you know. Um, is this part of building Creativity, what, what is the thinking behind here? What is the thrust of, of Finnish education? I, I think that we, just like New Zealand, we are both uh, nations and we will, we depend on uh, creativity right now and this will only get uh, uh, kind of a worse in, in the sense that the, the traditional knowledge and skills will lose their value and, and to be creative will be the kind of a capital of the nations and individuals. I think how we think about this in Finland is it's a, it's a very simple way of thinking. First of all, that there needs to be kind of a certain uh, sense of uh, safety or a fearless environment in schools and in society so that people can take risks. Because without, you know, trying things and uh, taking risks, you cannot really yeah. enter the kind of a, the, the, the area where your curiosity is. And if you don't take risks, if you're not curious about things, then there will be no creativity. And if there's no creativity, there's no innovation. So that's why I think for, for the Finns, it, I, the fundamental thing is that we need to have a school where where everybody feels safe, that they don't feel that, you know, we will be punished if, I, if we make a mistake. The Finnish schools, in a way, they kind of celebrate failure. So, so if, you, if you make a, a huge uh, kind of a failure after trying hard to do something, it's a, it's a, a worth of celebration rather than, than punishing things. So it's a kind of a cultural thing also. And I, I think the Finnish teachers and schools have been fairly good in you know, transforming this culture that we used to have that was very much based on being able to give the right answer at the right time in the right place and then you were uh, rewarded. But not anymore. Now it's more about the teachers are expecting that the, the children try things and they can, that's why the play is so important that they can kind of create this, uh, these skills. So creativity and, and innovation are extremely important uh, qualities right now. How do you measure that? How, how do we measure that? <laughs> well, well there, there is actually a kind of a movement or project initiative in, within the European Union of, uh, it's called uh, Measuring Creativity. And uh, I, I think people are saying that you cannot really measure creativity directly, but you can measure some of these, uh, some of, some of these factors and features that will lead to, to creativity, kind of a feed in, 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 into creativity. And um, I, I don't know if we need that type of uh, kind of exact measurement or com comparison or ranking of countries in terms of how creative their school systems are. But I, I think that we need some type of indication of whether the conditions for creativity are there. And those are those, uh, you know, how, how safe people feel there, how much room they have uh, to take risks, uh, try things, uh, experiment, how much opportunities they have uh, to work together in the small teams. Uh, and if these conditions are missing, then it's very likely that there will be no creativity. Because that, I asked the, the question because you know, taxpayers want to know whether they're getting value for money. Right. And if you can say to them, look, we took these tests and we did really well, so we must be doing all right. But you yeah. can't measure creativity yeah. in the yeah. same way. You yeah. can't um, measure happiness at school in the same way, can you? Yeah, no, but I think what we need to do in the future and actually right now is to also educate our parents more. And, you know, if we always rely on what the parents have been expecting uh, earlier, uh, and these expectations are very much inherited with the, from generation to generation. I think th th this road forward from here in education will be very difficult. I think we need to pay more attention to also, you know, in including parents into this conversation and say that, wait a minute, you know, everybody understands that, you know, this create, for example, the creativity is very import important for every individual, but that's something that we simply cannot measure. We cannot, the, the school cannot tell you that how creative your son or daughter is. That this is something that we have to, you know, trust the school and, you know, see, rather see what the school is doing rather than, uh, you know, how, how well the individuals are performing. So you, you used a very interesting word there, trust. Mm. Um, in New Zealand at the moment, the word is accountability. How do we make teachers accountable? Maybe we should trust them. Yeah, you know, this, I often speak about the uh, 
Um, and I, I think the New Zealand is actually in the business of uh, test-based accountability. But there's a, there, a lot of this accountability is related to standardized uh, assessments and tests. And then the alternative term that Finland has been employing and developing is a trust-based responsibility. And, and I always keep these two words together, the, the tests and accountability, because they, they belong to kind of the same, uh, same regime, and then trust and responsibility. And it's a very unfortunate, actually, that in English language, accountability has taken the, uh, the, the role of responsibility. And in my work, I often define, uh, people ask me that, so what, how do you define accountability in education, in, in Finnish context? And I often say that accountability is something that is left when responsibility is taken away. Yes. And I think it tells a lot about the, what, you know, what, what has happened now in, in, in this kind of an era of accountability when people feel that, you know, it's a, the, the teachers that should be held accountable and schools and what's happening at the same time when this accountability gets stronger, that's what I've seen yes. in New Zealand and many other places, then the responsibility within the school which uh, is getting, getting lesser. And particularly the responsibility that the, uh, the, the, the children should have over their own learning and development. And that's a kind of a big uh, um, mistake or, or damage that is happening in many countries, that the, the, the children are not more any, any more responsible because teachers are held accountable. There's a lot of talk in New Zealand about making teachers accountable. How do you make teachers accountable in Finland? Well, in Finland, we actually don't have a word accountability in education. It's a, it's a, it's a kind of a commercial term coming from accounting and, and when we speak about accountability that is accountability here in, in New Zealand we actually speak about responsibility and there's a there's a there's an interesting kind of a uh, th there are two alternatives there within this uh, global educational reform movement or germ that is very well known in, in New Zealand too uh, people often speak about accountability in the in the together with the standardized testing so that's why this test-based accountability is a common term in germ infected uh, school policies and systems but in Finland we we rather speak about trust based responsibility that are very different uh, different terms so in other words we try to kind of a cultivate the, the culture of trust in teachers and schools so that they they, 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 they would feel that they are trusted by everybody in the society, and then uh, make sure that the responsibility within the school between the, the teachers and students and, and in every classroom would get, uh, get uh, stronger. So the, the definition of, and I offer from Finland uh, for accountability is that it's, it's something that is left when responsibility is taken away. It wasn't an issue that came up when I was a teacher many years ago. I felt that parents trusted me to do my job. Um, and I suspect that teachers today feel as though there's a lot of pressure on them to perform, to test results, to try and be competitive. Um, uh, talk to me about um, what happens when a, a, a education system becomes too competitive and less cooperative. You know, first of all, I think that co cooperation and collaboration is the, uh, uh, is the essence of education. And the competition can have many forms there. And I often speak about unhealthy competition in education because part of the competition is a good, it may have a good form and a place in, in education. But I, I think that the, the difficulties emerge when we see education systems competing against one another. Uh, that we see is now so much because of these international comparisons and, and tests that are kind, kind of a, uh, ranking countries uh, according to the performance um, that comes from the students' uh, test results. That's not a good thing? Uh, I think it's, competition is not a good thing. I, I think if, if, if the countries think that they have to beat the other countries and be better than the others, uh, no matter the, the means or ways that gets there, there that's, not the, that's, not the, not, that's not a good thing to do because they, then we are kind of a playing with children and their lives and learning. Is that the same uh, with national standards, when we, we impose a standard and then we compare schools by printing the results? Uh, well, you know, the, the national level, when the schools get into the business of competing against one another over enrollment, uh, that, that's a kind of a dangerous game as well because then the schools are playing with these individual, uh, individual children. But they are like, a, you, you, could, you could even say that in Finland there, there is a sort of a competition between schools but it's a kind of a friendly competition where uh, the stakes are very low and uh, I, I think the kind of a, the, the spirit of the competition is to just try to do a little bit better than uh, or differently not, not necessarily better but differently than than your neighbor 
um, and that's always a kind of a sign of the friendly rivalry where, where people try to, you know, in a way help one another but still try to get, uh, get better. But the competition is a, is a kind of a complicated term because, you know, part of the competition is, is, a, good, is a kind of a driver of renewal and, and people will start to do, do things in a different way. But when the competition gets unhealthy in, in education, it's the same with the, at the level of individuals. Then people start to do things that are not good for, uh, that it's not good for education and not good for individuals. Talking about equity and fairness, how are schools organised? Is, is there a zone? Do you do you go to the school that's nearest to you, or how does it work? In Finland, yes. How uh, do you how do you guarantee that every child gets a fair look at the spoon? Yeah, well, you know, it, it, we we have a school choice in Finland, but it's within the public school system. So since, since there are no private schools there, and there are no alternative or charter schools, or very few of them. Uh, the choice is between one public school and another. And in the larger cities, for example, parents can choose uh, other school that is their neighborhood school. Although the, the government policy and the local education policies, they're, they're always kind of encouraging um, you know, parents to have their children in a neighborhood school. But in, in practice, there, there, is, uh, there is this choice. You see, because in New Zealand, land values have become tied to schools. Yeah. You, know, yeah. uh, you know, good schools yeah. have got yeah. you know expensive land values. So how, does that, how does that work in Finland? Yeah, you know, Finland. We are still a country where the uh, the the performance differences statistically between our schools are the smallest in the world. So um, uh, you you can find different schools within the same city, for example, in terms of how they do. Uh, but it's, it's a very minor, it's much less than in, in New Zealand or in the United States or England. So, you know, all the parents, I'm one of those, uh, and I, I know that, you know, the nearest school that is in my, uh, my home, it's, it's always a good school. And so the, the question more for Finns, Finnish parents is that, do I want to have a primary school for my child where he or she can do more sports or music, music or study different foreign languages, start with French, for example? Or do I want to get my son to the school where everybody else is going and just have a normal program, rather than, uh, you know, thinking about whether this is a better school than that one? I, I think very few few parents are really concerned about this uh, betterness of uh, of the school that way. People I can hear at the other end of this camera saying, "That's fine for you. You're a pretty homogeneous society. You know, we're a very diverse society. We've got uh, lots of people from the Pacific. We mm -hmm. have a large now immigrant uh, population of Asian people." Plus, uh, you know, Pakeha, New Zealanders, you know, we've got a cocktail of, of ethnic backgrounds. Right. How is it in Finland? Well, Finland is changing very fast too, but we are still far away from uh, what many, many OECD countries, including New Zealand or Australia are. But we are having a lot of people moving in from other countries without any any knowledge or skills uh, of the Finnish language. And uh, the other thing is that many of those who move to Finland, they often move to urban areas. The capital area, for example, is a, is a, is a very common place for people to find their, their housing or living and then, then work. And that's why uh, many of those uh, people you know, find their places there. We have an estimate in, in Helsinki, that is the capital um, uh, city of Finland, that by year 2020, so it's like five, six years from now, about 20% of the uh, students in Helsinki city schools Will be immigrant somehow immigrant back up, background children. So and this uh, t 20 30 years ago that was practically there was practically nobody there. So we are we are in a kind of a very rapidly changing situation and uh, and trying to do our best with this. When I was five years old, if somebody had said to me, "One day, Brian, pictures are going to fly through the sky, and they're going to land up in your on a screen in your living room or maybe somebody's bedroom, and you're going to be on that screen and you're going to be talking to them," I would have said. <laughs> We've got no idea, yeah. really, what the future is going to hold right. for our children. Right. What kind of skills, what kind of thinking should we be developing in our children to prepare them for a future we have no idea what it will be like? Yeah, I, I think this may be, it may be a wrong question. That the, the knowledge and skills, we, th this is how we used to think, that we need knowledge, we need certain skills before we can, you know, cope and deal with this unknown future. Uh, future has been unknown always, but now it's, I, I think we are just more aware. We are, we are convinced now that we simply don't understand what is, uh, what is waiting for us. But then I, I think this gets, 
co goes closer to the question that what is the what is the purpose of uh, schooling and mm. education? What, what is the purpose of public schooling that is meant for mm. for everybody, all the mm. children? And I think uh, you know I, 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 I'm a strong believer of the thing that we we should think about schooling uh, now and certainly in the future as a, as a kind of a thing that will help every individual, all the children, to realize what they're good at. Mm. In other words, somehow help them to discover their own talent, their own kind of area of passion mm. that they really feel that they want to do and uh, that they want to improve and do it for other people and do it for, for themselves. And, and that's why, you know, I'm, when I think about the future of the schooling, I'm, I'm not so much thinking about knowledge, content knowledge anymore, what they need to know, and not even skills. I think we, we all understand what are these basic uh, uh, skills we need to be able to, uh, you know, be together and work together and uh, uh, have certain ethical uh, background, empathy, mm -hmm. uh, leadership, uh, teamwork, mm -hmm. all, you know, all these skills. I think that's a kind of a, everybody agrees that, you know, this, this is a long list of expectations yes. that we have for our kids. But what we don't agree so much is this, that if we, um, you know, if we had a school system where in New Zealand or in Finland where more young people would leave by saying that, you know, the, thank you very much school because you helped me to realize who I am, what I want to do. And now when I go, I want to continue, you know, developing this, uh, 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 this uh, my own talent with passion for all my life. I think that's, that's a kind of a hopeful thing. Mm -hmm. I don't think we need people who will leave the school system and say that I have all A's, uh, grades are A, and, uh, uh, but I don't know what to do with these things. Maybe I do this or maybe I do that. That's, that's something that we, your country or mine will not uh, be happy with. But so we need people who are passionate of doing something because of the school. Thank you. That's a completely different answer to what other people would give. Uh, they would say, look, you know, um, we need to prepare you to work in the economy. Sure, and there are those who say that we, we need to focus on this 21st century skills. Some people, by the way, say that the 21st century skills will lead to this type of thing, that this will prepare kids for the uh, mm. uh, 21st century economy. Mm. But I think that you know, what I was saying about this, uh, you know, finding your talent and being able to work, uh, you know, work with your element, this is exactly the same thing and actually it's even more. Because those people who you know, do things passionately, they are also much more useful for the economy and for the society when they work like this. And it's all that uh, resilience stuff about being able to cope with whatever life will throw at you. Exactly. And, and yeah. Not just yeah. the thinking of yeah. kind of working yeah. out this yeah. problem, but yeah. you know, this is happening in my life. Uh, how do I deal with this? Yeah. That's yeah. Sort of yeah. So you know, many, many people say that the, these young youngsters who are in a, in a primary school in New Zealand or Finland now, they have to they have to learn seven or ten new jobs during their lives. So this is, it's not a question about knowledge and skills anymore. It's, it's, a, it's a more about your ability to, you know, renew yourself, you know, change regularly, do one thing and then, you know, educate, learn something new and then do it. So that's why it's a, it's a, it's a great question. You set a very high standard for teachers, don't you? They have to have a master's degree, isn't That's they? right. Mm. Okay. And so the process of becoming a teacher is quite rigorous. It is, yeah. There's a, there's a strict control of quality at entry in Finland. Right. And then do you uh, have programs where teachers can um, learn new skills, be brought up to date, um, those sorts of things? Sure, yeah. yeah there's a, uh, the country invests a lot in continuous professional development of teachers all the time. And that's done based on the kind of uh, national priorities, what we think are the important areas of uh, um, teacher development. So is there a structure that comes from some ministry or other that looks at, oversees all of this? I ask because uh, teacher development is a matter for schools, you know, some teachers get it, some teachers don't. Right. So, so how does this work in Finland? Is there a kind of an overarching um, ad advisory uh, supervision? No, you know, this, the most part of this comes with the, the professional responsibility that our teachers have. And school leaders, I, I think the role of school leaders in this uh, issue is very, very important. So if you're a school leader, principal in Finland, your responsibility is to make sure that your staff, your faculty, teachers there will be, will have access and resources to professional development. If I'm a school principal in Finland and I have teacher or teachers who are not willing to do anything, uh, that's my, my job is to go to them and say that, uh, how can I help you, what, what, what could we do? 
So that's why um, uh, it's, it's a kind of a more based on responsibility than uh, than control. But I have a comment on this. You know, people often ask uh, ask about this high high level of tr training of teachers in Finland. That why why do we have master's degree and not only master's degree, but it's a academic research based uh, degree. Uh, that is similar to law or medicine or, med or other degrees, mm -hmm. and um, I often say that you know if you if you don't have a highly educated teaching force, they, the, this community of professionals will not be able to protect themselves mm -hmm. from bad ideas from outside. Just like if you think about the medical doctors, they because of the strong sense of community that they have as professionals, they are able to protect their profession from. Um, kind of a uh, questionable means of cure for any type of uh, disease or sickness that they have. They, med medical doctors would never accept anything that they, is not research based by, proved by research and tested and experimented. So that they're absolutely confident that, you know, this is, this is something that is worth trying. If we don't have well-trained teachers, uh, the teaching profession is equally vul uh, vulnerable to the um, kind of external ideas. In, in New Zealand, you know this very well, but because of this global educational reform movement, I, idea of competition and accountability and testing and standardization that has kind of entered um, in New Zealand. And it's partly because, it's partly because of the uh, policies that have been insisting these things, but it's also partly because of the, uh, the teaching profession has not been given a kind of an opportunity to, uh, you know, address these issues in a professional way. And it's a, this is the same thing in every, every country that often the reason for these germ types of ideas within the education system is, is that there is that the, the, the teaching profession has not been able to or have not had a voice to raise these concerns properly. The other area too there is that there was this idea abroad in New Zealand that all you have to do is simply pay good teachers more mm -hmm. and that will solve the problem. What do you think? Yeah, well, again, you know, this is a kind of a global thing is that the many, in many countries people seem to think that the problem is uh, with teachers, that if, if only we get the kind of a better, te better young individuals and, and better teachers paid more that this will... Uh, this will solve the problem, but we know everybody knows that, the, for example, the bonus or merit-based pay for teachers is a, mm. is a nonsense. There's no evidence. There's actually evidence that it's going to do harmful, bad things for um, uh, for the whole profession than than the good things. So, uh, I, I think people should think this whole thing again and um, and and uh, you know leave a little bit space for this uh, uh, question that this this is really all about teachers. Maybe this is because of some other things and. Uh, uh, we researchers, we do know that uh, you know much of this that explains students' learning is actually has nothing to do with the school and, and very little to do with the teachers. So it's something that is an uh, issue within the society, with, within the families, the peer uh, uh, social groups and others, and not teachers. So I think it's, a, it's not kind of a justified way of thinking. Mm. Yes, I, I, I asked the question because um, it seems to me that teachers aren't driven by money, particularly. You know, it, money's important to get by and, yeah. and who, who would want to pay teachers less and all of that. But there is something in the DNA of teachers which has to do with empathy, with giving, with, with sharing. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and if you have an education system that denies those yeah. things, yeah. then you've got a yeah. problem. Yeah. yeah, certainly there are people among teachers who do it for money, who, who, who are teaching because it's a, it's a nice way to make, uh, uh, you know, earn what you earn. But most teachers, uh, most of them, uh, everybody that I know who is in the teaching profession is there because of the uh, mission, because they want to do uh, certain things, they want to change people's lives. And that's why I think it's, it's, a, it's a kind of a um, violation against this uh, morale of many teachers to say that I give you more money if you raise the test scores of the kids. And this, it doesn't work like this. Last question. If you were can, uh, hired as a consultant to change the New Zealand education system, what would be your key message to our Minister of Education? I am a, I'm, I'm a person who takes equity very seriously and, and I, I do know a little bit about the, the New Zealand uh, school system. So I, I would probably start to um, start this consultancy with the meeting with uh, the wide range of uh, educators and, and stakeholders in New Zealand to speak about the equity, what does it mean, and what are we doing, and is there something, some, something that needs to be done? 
I, I would certainly try to, um, uh, again, coming from Finland, I would try to enhance the, the, the trust in, in schools and teachers. Uh, I have been in New Zealand uh, a couple of times and I've seen that there's a, um, uh, that there's everything is not in, uh, in, in order in terms of uh, uh, this kind of a relationship between teachers and the, the rest of the community. And I think, and I've seen that every country where there is a kind of a conflict or emerging conflict between between the teachers and the the government or the rest of the society, things are likely to get worse. So I'll try to, uh, you know, restore this uh, that used to be uh, a profession that people were trusting and uh, and trying to build consensus rather than conflict. But the the equity would be my my main and uh, my my first thing to really discuss and talk and try to define what we mean by equity and then see what needs to be done. New Zealand has this uh, long tail of uh, very low performing students. New Zealand is also an interesting country because it has one of the highest proportion of the very high achieving students in the OECD PISA study. And that would be a kind of an interesting thing to ask that, so what can we do to, you know, even not to take these uh, high achievers away, but uh, help this tail a little bit.